Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Zoom captured edition of my Norland Scholars Conference Senior Capstan presentation on utilizing atmospheric drag for low Earth orbit satellite formation keeping. I'm sad that I can't be presenting this to you in person, but I think we can all agree that this is the next best alternative. In this presentation, I'll be talking about what it takes to organize satellites mid flight without the use of thrusters or propulsion. So a bit of an overview, uh, I'll be talking about the background of my project, including a bit about myself and what I do. Uh, I'll be talking about the general principles of science and engineering that constrain the design of my project, the methods and analysis used to develop my algorithm, and lastly, the implications of my results or how they can be used in other applications. Clearly, uh, this presentation is going to be a bit technical, but it is my goal to walk you through this process and help you understand how one approaches satellite design through the lens of an engineer and why this field can be both exciting and rewarding for anyone involved. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, so who am I? My name is Mitchell Spencer. I am a senior in aerospace engineering um, and I'm soon to begin my master's in the same subject at CU. I'm a command controller at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics on East Campus, where I do mission operations um, for many different science satellites. So uh, at work, I engage in real-time contacts with satellites in orbit, um, directly contacting them. I also do um, analysis on telemetry, uh, or data pulled down from the satellites. Um, and then I also do development work for various programs and models that are used in general mission ops at LASP. So one day at work, I was contacted by some scientists at the Space Science Center, SPSC, also on East Campus, who wanted my help uh, to do analysis on a mission proposal concept that they had in mind. This was a bit outside of my, uh, outside of the general work that I needed to do at last, but I accepted because I thought this would be a really unique opportunity for me, um, especially to flex some of the knowledge that I had from some of the classes I've taken in my undergrad. Um, they were specifically designing a mission with the following details. They were gonna have multiple satellites arranged in a string of pearls satellite formation. So as you can see from this image, uh, there's one orbit, but there are multiple satellites on this orbit um, arranged in a line. So it does look like a necklace or a string of pearls. Um, they also specified it was going to be low earth orbit. So uh, below 2000 kilometers in altitude, specifically they were ballparking around 400 to 600 um, uh, uh, kilometers in altitude, and this is going to be part of the analysis I'd be working on is determining that altitude. They said that there would be no onboard propellant, um, so basically no thrusters, and then they told me that it would be collecting ionosphere science, um, and with a string of pearls formation, this would allow for simultaneous ionosphere measurements at different latitudes. So um, this begs the question, what is the ionosphere and why is this important? So the ionosphere is the uppermost region of our atmosphere where all satellite signals must pass through. Um, the sun will ionize the particles in the ionosphere, hence the name, which induces noise or error on your signal. So a uh, better understanding of the ionosphere will help us predict this noise and hopefully get rid of it for more accurate communications for satellites, um, for GPS tracking, et cetera. There's, there's a lot of applications here. So one thing that they needed my help on um, was a bit of attitude analysis. What is attitude? Attitude is defined as the spacecraft's orientation in three dimensions. Um, this is not to be confused with altitude, which is the spacecraft's height above sea level. So the general questions I was tasked to investigate were, how can changes in attitude induce different amounts of drag? So there is drag in space. Uh, even in space, there are enough particles that can significantly reduce the energy of an orbiting body. And I was also asked, how can we utilize this drag to change the distance between any two spacecrafts in a string of pearls formation? So uh, specifically, when the satellite constellation is initially launched, all of the satellites are going to exist in roughly the same point in space in their orbit. So how do we use drag to space them out to achieve their, their string of pearls formation? So this leads us into the general principles um, that will guide us to uh, developing the algorithm that I ultimately came up with to solve this problem. Um, so one thing that is important to understand is attitude manipulation um, through the use of reaction wheels. Reaction wheels allow a spacecraft to change attitude without any thrusters. So this all comes down to the conservation of momentum, or in this case, angular momentum, 
if uh, any one of these wheels spins really fast, then the spacecraft will slowly start to spin the opposite direction about the same axis in order to counteract that and preserve um, the energy on board the spacecraft. So if you look at this GIF here, this is kind of a mock-up of a satellite in space, right? It's uh, freely rotating about this chain, um, and only when the reaction wheels engage do you see that uh, the the attitude of the spacecraft is completely controlled to any outside perturbations. And if you can control a spacecraft's attitude, you can also manipulate it. Um, so ultimately, uh, if we have three reaction wheels, this allows for control in all three dimensions. And by manipulating the attitude of a spacecraft, I can change which side of the spacecraft, um, especially an asymmetric spacecraft, faces forward in its orbit. And thus, I can change how much drag the spacecraft is experiencing at a given time. So um, it's important that we understand a little bit about the um, basics of orbital mechanics. So one thing that's uh, really important to understand is that satellites in lower orbits or lower altitudes will fly faster than those in higher orbits. This is a really crucial concept and it's kind of counterintuitive um, you know, at first glance. So if two satellites are flying side by side, and one experiences drag and the other uh, experiences less drag, we would expect logically in our heads that the satellite experiencing uh, more drag would fall behind. But instead, in space, it'll appear to fly ahead of the satellite experiencing less drag. Um, this is basically because the satellite experiencing the drag is brought into a lower orbit. So when it's brought into a lower orbit, it speeds up. So while it's flying fast relative to the other satellite, it's still losing more energy due to the forces of drag. So one way we can kind of rationalize this behavior is by imagining the planets orbiting around the sun. So if we think of planets as satellites around the central body of the sun, um, we can kind of correspond this behavior. Um, specifically, there is a mathematical relationship that governs um, the speed of the rotating bodies uh, versus how far away from the sun is or how large their radius of their orbit is. So um, bodies like Uranus and Neptune take a much, much longer time to orbit around the sun than say Mercury or Venus do, and that's just because of how far away they are. So we can liken this analog to the satellites orbiting around Earth um, and, and understand that satellites orbiting at a lower orbit or at a lower altitude will be moving much faster. And these are the crucial concepts that we're going to be using to our advantage in constructing our algorithm. So last thing that's important to um, take into account is the shape of the satellite. So here's kind of a mock-up of what each satellite is going to look like in the string of pearls. There is the uh, main body here in the center and then two solar rays sticking out on the sides. Since it's technically a CubeSat mission, the overall design is rather small. And you can look at the bottom right for the dimensions here. Um, and the takeaway here is just to understand that there are two ways in which we can orient the spacecraft. We can orient it so that uh, the spacecraft is facing with more drag um, at, towards the direction of the orbit. So if the direction of the orbit were going through the screen, um, we would experience more drag because there's more surface area facing forward. Conversely, if the orbit were facing left and right through the screen, then the satellite would be experiencing the least amount of drag because there's the least amount of surface area facing in the direction of velocity. So now I'm gonna go over the um, methods and analysis used to develop you know, the, um, the frame of thinking and, and the algorithm that I've come up with. So ultimately I needed to use a, um, a third party software to model some of the orbital decay. So SDK or Systems Toolkit is the software that LASP uses to model satellite orbits. Here you can see a graphic of just a single one of the satellites in our string of pearls. And uh, using this model, I can predict what will happen to the spacecraft as I continue further in time. So we can use this to model um, drag over time and see what happens to the spacecraft. So here you can see um, the decay of the orbit over time. So on the bottom axis, uh, you see hours and, and the entire range of the bottom axis is one full year here. And with enough testing, I was able to determine that these satellites would have to be launched at a minimum starting altitude of about 520 kilometers if they're going to maintain orbit for at least one full year. Um, so here you see that if a spacecraft remained in the high drag configuration for the entire year, 
Um, it'll start to rapidly decline in altitude towards the end of the year as, it, as the effects of drag become more and more prominent, pulling the spacecraft further down in the atmosphere, where eventually it'll actually burn up due to the incredible heat experienced in re-entry. Um, in contrast, you can also see what would happen if it were to remain in low drag and the low drag attitude configuration for the entire year. Um, clearly, it does not decay as much, even though it still does just a little bit, um, but uh, the effects of drag are not as great. So uh, now given these models of orbital decay, how can we use these uh, or use the difference in the trajectories between the high and the low drag attitudes to separate any two satellites by an arbitrary distance, say 60 degrees about the center of the Earth? Well, uh, we'll have to come up with a creative sequence of maneuvers to accomplish this. So whatever we choose to do, it's important that the satellites end at identical altitudes after the maneuver, because if they don't, then the satellites will exist in fundamentally different orbits, and therefore they won't maintain their relative distance over time. So here's kind of a concept of operations that I came up with. Um, so in general, on the left, you can see altitude versus time of, the, of, of just any two arbitrary satellites in the string of pearls that we choose to observe. And on the right, you can see a diagram of how they orbit around the Earth. So, um, after launch, they are going to exist at roughly the same point in space, and they're going to trend um, in, in nearly the same fashion and maintain close to the same altitude. So um, at a given time when we decide that we want to start spacing out these satellites, we will, um, if, if we're just working with two for the most basic case right now, um, let's say we decide uh, at this given time we're going to begin this sequence of maneuvers. So what we'll do is we will, uh, assuming that they're both starting out in the low drag attitude configuration, we're going to switch the red satellite to from a low to a high drag configuration. This will pull the red satellite down into a lower orbit closer to the Earth. And like we discussed, um, this will speed it up because it's in a lower orbit. So while it's dropping in altitude, it's going to appear to move faster and farther ahead from the blue satellite. Um, so let's just see what happens. So we see that the red satellite has dropped in altitude and has gained speed. Um, so now at, a, at another point in time, we decide that um, we need the blue satellite to also come down to the same altitude. Like I mentioned in the previous slide, um, if they're going to maintain whatever angular distance uh, they end up at, they need to end at the same altitude. Otherwise, they'll continue to drift apart forever. So we're going to switch the red satellite from the high drag to low drag configuration, and then vice versa. We're going to turn uh, the blue satellite so that it is facing in the high drag configuration as well. So now we can expect the blue satellite to fall in altitude over time. However, since the red satellite is still further below the blue satellite in altitude, it's still in the lower orbit and it will continue to travel faster than the blue satellite. So it still has more distance to gain on the blue satellite. So now you see uh, they are both at the same altitude, um, but they are a significant distance apart from each other. But since, uh, since they're both at the same altitude, we can make sure that both of them are now switched back to the low drag configuration and they will continue um, at this angular distance apart from each other um, for the remainder of time and, until we decide to do another maneuver on them for whatever reason. So continuing forward, we should expect that they would travel at the same altitude and maintain their distance apart from each other. So with this in mind, I can write an algorithm to routinely solve for when these attitude changes would need to happen uh, in order to achieve the desired distance of 60 degrees. The only information I really need is the trending of these red and blue lines over here, um, uh, which, I, which I already have from the previous plots that I've shown you about how each satellite decays with time. So I can just use that data and plug it in here and use some math to solve for how long this takes. So, uh, the calculated results kind of speak for themselves. Uh, here you see um, the units associated with these uh, uh, maneuvers, and you see that over a given period of time, it does taper off and reach a, a distance of 60 degrees apart um, between the two satellites. And this takes approximately 51 days. So, um, what are the implications of all of this? Like, where, wh what other um, uses does this have? So, uh, the computations that I've conducted ultimately verify the initial conjectures of the proposal team and figured that this was a reasonable possibility. 
ultimately demonstrates that a cluster of satellites starting at the same position after just one launch can organize into a string of pearls formation uh, through just the use of drag and attitude changes alone. Ultimately, the algorithm I developed to solve this in the manner outlined above uh, can be applied to any satellite mission design or purpose. It works for really any given satellite shape, orbit, or desired formation that you really need. So um, any this, this can be additionally applied to other cases as well. You know, at 60 degrees is really just an arbitrary value. So um, you can see from this analysis here that there is a linear correlation between the desired angle and how long it would take. So this uh, analysis can be uh, further extended to other cases as well. And that pretty much sums up the bulk of my work on this project. So thanks so much for listening, and I hope you've learned a little bit about satellite engineering and design that you can take with you going forward. I'm eager to hear any questions that you might have in the upcoming Q&A session. I'd really like to thank Charles Labondi, who's been my faculty advisor at LASP. I'd like to thank Pat Smith, my SDK consultant and wizard. He's been a huge help with all of the SDK work. Layla Anderson was the proposal scientist who reached out to me from SPSC. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Joan Gabriel and the entire SVP team who have organized the Scholars Conference and facilitated its transition to an online medium. Thank you guys. I'm glad we still had this opportunity to present. So thanks and have a fantastic rest of your day.